morning today we are going to discuss about the instruments which are commonly used in tonsillectomy surgeries so i will be showing you all the instruments one by one of course these instruments may not be the same like you are using inside your theater or which you have seen inside a theater there could be some minor modifications but let me assure you that the principle of all these instruments are literally the same. So, we will take one instrument after the other. And tonsillectomy surgery is actually an operating procedure where you go ahead and remove the infected tonsillar tissue. You need to do a subcapsular uh, dissection, strip the tonsil away from the capsule. For that to happen effectively, you need to use a specialized set of instruments. The first set of instrument is the one which you use to keep the mouth open. So that is known as a mouth gag. So this is known as a Boyle Davis mouth gag. This is actually a two instruments combined to one. This is shaped like a D. You can see this instrument. This is shaped like a D. So this is D for Davis and this is Boyle's tongue blade. This is Boyle's tongue blade. So these two instruments can be merged together to make a single instrument. And this particular mouth gag is supposed to be known as a Doughty's variant of Boyle's Davis mouth gag. This is actually a Doughty's mouth gag. I will show you the difference between uh, Doughty's variant of Boyle's Davis mouth gag. So you see the Boyle's tongue blade, you see a slit here. So this slit will not be seen in a Boyle Davis uh, mouth cat. The tongue blade of a Boyle Davis mouth cat won't be having this slit. This slit is, has an important role. This is a vital modification where when you put this, uh, when you use this tongue blade to open the mouth of the patient and the anesthetist has used a uh, orotracheal intubation where the uh, endotracheal tube is seen within the oral cavity so you can ensure that the oral tracheal tube the anesthetist tube will be within this slit so it will be within the slit so when you attempt to open the mouth there won't be any compression of the endotracheal tube there won't be any compression of the endotracheal tube it is absolutely essential for the endotracheal tube to be compression free during the surgery if there is even a minimal amount of compression the anesthetist will have problems ventilating the patient so i always uh, advise you to go in for a doughty's modification of a boyle's davis mouth gag i repeat again this boyle's davis mouth gag with doughty's modified tongue blade is the two instruments put into one one is the d-shaped this is a Davis mouth gag and this is a Boyle's tongue blade or the Doughty's modification which happens to be the slit. You are seeing the slit now. So how are you going to merge both these instruments into one? So there is a clamp here. You compress the clamp like this and inside the slot you drop like this. So it will fall there. So you release the clamp. So the clamp will anchor the tongue blade in a desired position. So now when you attempt to open the mouth of a patient, all you got to do is drag it up to the desired level and allow the clamp to rest in that slot. So it will arrest the movement of the tongue blade. So it gets locked. In fact, it's a locking mechanism. So by pressing this, you disengage the lock by allowing the lock to set, release it the lock gets set. So now you press, it will fall. So this is the uh, Boyle's Davis tongue blade. And now you see, I will disengage and show you again. So this is where these two prongs, these two prongs should be protected by soft rubber padding. So these prongs will be resting on the patient's incisor. So if you don't put a rubber protector, there is always a chance of teeth of the patient being damaged when you attempt to keep the mouth open. So this is how you engage. You just 
assemble boils davis mouth okay you just press the lever like this i repeat okay press the lever like this engaging lever then drop the tongue blade into the slot and then disengage it so this is as far as the boils davis mouth gag this is a doughty's modification of boils davis mouth gag now i'll be showing there are you can have a set of blades so this so right now i'm displaying about four different sizes of tongue blades see i am having a four different types of tongue blades this is the smallest one which you use it in a neonet so neonet we don't use uh, uh, to perform we don't do tonsillectomy for a neonatal patient but this will be useful when you do a cleft palate repair in a neonet when you attempt to do a cleft palate repair in an infant this mouth gag will be suitable now how and the other mouth gags are of varying sizes you see so these are all the varying size of mouth gag so roughly speaking there will be three or four uh, different sizes of mouth gag so how are you going to pick up the best size or the optimal size that that you can use for the patient so this is actually you take the tongue blade and then you place it from the, at the angle of the jaw from the tragus to the angle of the jaw so this tongue blade approximate size of the tongue blade should be the distance between the tragus and the angle of the mouth so that will be the optimal size that you should use to open the mouth of the patient this is as far as the boils davis mouth gag goes so you can keep the mouth open but it needs to be stabilized it needs to be kept in a stationary position with the mouth open so it needs a supporting device so for that supporting device you use a drafting pot with a magurum horizontal maguron plate this is actually the maguron plate this plate has say around uh, seven slots on either side so this will be placed horizontally under the neck of the patient under the neck of the patient and this is the i'm going to show you the drafin bipod this is the drafin bipod so what you do is you just I will assemble the drafting pipe bipod and show it to you. It should be assembled like this in a cross. So it will be assembled like this in a cross. So you just anchor this plane like this and then place it here so this should be crossed like this and the lower end will be seated on the slot in the magurans plate so this is approximately how you keep the mouth opening stabilized using a graphene bipod that is two part this has around four rings you see the four rings so you are according to the need of the patient according to the mouth opening of the patient you can use any of these slots to keep the mouth open so you cross it like this so supposing you want to say use a second slot you know, use the second slot again use it like this so what happens is as you see the higher the slot if you use the first slot the high the taller the uh, bipod begins Whereas, if you use the lower worst one, it is the shortest, the distance between the patient and the uh, tongue blade becomes a shorter. So, in, a, in other words, you can increase or decrease the height of the uh, mouth opening or the level of the mouth opening by appropriately putting the tongue blade, securing the tongue blade inside the hole, cross to hole of the drafin bipod. And then, the crossed bipod should be placed to sit so i will put the maguran split so this is how it should be slotted see this is how it should be assembled so this plate horizontal plate maguran plate will be under the shoulder of the patient and uh, the drafting bipod will be seating like this and the tongue blade will be placed within the hole 
graphene by bond hole. I think you should be able to appreciate this. This is how we keep the mouth open during the surgery. So the next instrument which we will be using is to hold the tonsil. So this is actually known as the valsalum. This is the valsalum or the tonsil holding forceps. So you see this has a locking mechanism. I see by pressing you can lock by releasing the lock you can open. So ideally you should be able to hold this valsalum between the index finger and your thumb. You hold the instrument between the index finger and thumb. So this you can see the tip is pointed as three or four teeth. It, you can as soon as you grasp the tonsil you lock it and you can slowly pull the tonsil medially. So it has a gentle medial curvature. It has a gentle medial curvature so that the moment you put it inside it will effortlessly slide into the oropharynx. So you unlock it and hold the tonsil. The right tonsil you use the I'm sorry the left tonsil you use the right hand and the right tonsil you switch the instrument to this side so that the curvature will be pointing towards the tonsil. So so when your tonsillectomy is ideally performed in an ambidextrous way, you should learn to use the instruments in both hands. So a tonsillectomy surgeon invariably is comfortable using both the hands. So this is actually a valsalum. So if you want to operate on the tonsil, say on the right side, you hold the valsalum on the left, hold it with your index finger in the upper hole and the thumb in the lower hole and then you Hold the tonsillar tissue like this, grasp it, pull it medially and then start operating. So I repeat again, when you want to hold the right tonsil, you hold the valsalum in your left hand. If you are going to operate on the left tonsil, you hold the valsalum in your right hand, the opposite side. So why? because you ensure the curvature is always pointing towards the direction of the tonsil. The curvature of the valsalum should be pointing towards the direction of the tonsil. So there are various variants of these uh, tonsil holding forceps and uh, I'll be, this is actually the classic uh, uh, tonsil holding forceps. This is actually the classic tonsil holding forceps, no frills uh, attached and uh, so you can, it has a self-retaining clamps available. The moment you lock, you can lock it. So the moment you lock it, your hands are totally free. So this is a valsalum or tonsil holding forceps. So you, you use this instrument to hold the tonsil. I have already told you how to hold it using your index finger and thumb. Let us go to the next instrument. The next instrument I am going to show you is the vas tenaculum forceps. This is nothing but a yeah, tooth forceps, which has a sharp teeth above. Always ensure the teeth sharp pointed area is above and the slot for the teeth is below. So you, this is actually a vas tenaculum forceps. This is actually known as vas tenaculum forceps. The word tenaculum means capsule. So you use this forceps to make a incision. So you narrow, make the jaws of the forceps as small as possible. And then using the sharp tooth of the tenaculum forceps, you mark the incision to the, just close to the, me, just medial to the anterior pillar of the tonsil in the mucosa. So you put the side the incision, medial to the, anterior pillar as close to the anterior pillar as possible the mucosal incision should be sighted medial to the anterior pillar as close to the anterior pillar as possible you should not damage the anterior pillar at the same time you should not damage the anterior pillar the incision should be sighted medial to the anterior pillar and vas tenaculum forceps is used to push put the incision so this is the instrument which you use to start the surgery by putting the incision. Then, this is actually a Mollison's pillar retractor on that dissector. So this end is the tonsil dissector. Mollison tonsil dissector. You use this to dissect the tonsil away from the 
capsule. We use it to dissect the tonsil away from the capsule. And this is actually the pillar retractor. So you hold it like this and retract the tonsillar pillar. So when you want to uh, use it in the right tonsillar fossa, or if you want to dissect the right tonsil, use your right hand. And then if you want to use it for the left tonsillar uh, tonsil or left tonsil fossa, you switch the instrument to the left hand. So this is Mollison's pillar retractor with dissector. The dissector is here and this one is the pillar retractor. This is the pillar retractor and this is the dissector. So both instruments are combined into a single instrument. This is Mollison's pillar retractor with tonsillar dissector. Now here, this is a briquet curved forceps. This is a briquet curved artery forceps, which is long and you should hold the forceps between, again I'm telling you, between your index finger and thumb. So this forceps, you can use to hold the inferior pedicle of the tonsil. You can, as soon as you complete the dissection up to the lower pole of the tonsil, you can use this uh, briquettes uh, curved artery forceps, use it to clamp the lower pole and then use a scissor to cut the tonsil. Or in sometimes you can also use a eaves tonsillar snare during the, because normally I desist from using this snare, but for the sake of completion, I will be demonstrating, I will be showing you uh, a picture of eaves tonsillar snare and how it looks like when you apply the snare to the tonsillar tissue. But I personally don't like a eaves tonsillar snare because it, the snare wire tends to get broken down at a crucial time and then you will have a terrible time into in disengaging, attempting to disengage the entangled wire inside the tonsillar tissue. So I always like to clamp the lower pole of the tonsil with this curved artery or a briquet forceps and then use a, this is actually a Metzenbaum curved scissor. This is a Metzenbaum curved scissor. Again, it's a long thin scissor. Again, you use this scissor. Okay. Always you ensure you hold the scissor between your index finger and the thumb. And supposing the you should ensure that the curvature of the scissor should always be pointing towards the ulna. The curvature of the scissor should always be pointing towards the ulna. It has, you see, it has a very gentle curvature. It has a very gentle curvature like this. So whenever you use this, um, uh, mix and bomb scissor that you ensure that the tip always points towards the ulna. So supposing you are going to cut the right tonsil, you hold your mix and bomb scissors on your right hand and then ensure that the curvature is towards the ulna when you attempt to cut the tonsil tissue. And again on the other side, on the left side, similarly you use the same scissors and ensure that the uh, curvature is towards the ulna and you you should first clamp the lower pole with the curved artery curved briquette long briquette fossa before you attempt to cut the tonsil out of the tonsillar fossa the next i am going to show you is a briquettes straight artery forceps this is a bricket straight artery forceps. You have already seen the bricket's curved artery forceps. Now I'm going to show you the bricket straight artery forceps. This forceps again can be engaged and disengaged. It is also, it has a set of teeth here so that you can clamp it. You can clamp it by locking it. So you can lock it, you can unlock it. You use your index finger and thumb to lock and unlock this forceps. So this is known as Briquettes straight artery forceps. This forceps classically is used to catch the bleeder. So if there is a bleeding point, you just use this forceps to catch the bleeder and then you use the briquettes curved artery forceps again to catch it, catch it once again. So when you catch it once again, 
the tip will be pointing medially so you can pass a silk thread along that tip and you can use it to tie a knot so when you attempt to tie a knot on a bleeder first you catch the bleeder using a straight bracket forceps and then lift the bracket forceps and hold the bleeder with the curved bracket forceps and along the curvature you slip the silk thread pull the thread out of the mouth and put the knot so to tighten the knot you use your index finger if you have a very long finger ideally your index finger is the best so that you will have better control you will know how tight the knot is so you use your fingers to tighten the knot if you have a smaller finger and you are finding it difficult to reach the tonsillar fossa with your fingers you try to use another instrument known as negus knot adjuster so personally speaking i have a very long finger so i have not had the uh, i have not faced the necessity or had the need to use negus knot adjuster but still uh, for the sake of completion i will be showing you the image of a negus knot adjuster so that that knot adjuster can be used to tighten the knot when you attempt to ligate a bleeder in the tonsillar fossa the next instrument i am going to show you is the adenoid surgical instrument this is known as sinclair thompson adenoid forceps with cage so this is known as a sinclair thompson adenoid forceps with cage so again this is the cage so this instrument is held like a dagger it is held like a dagger this dagger you push it under the soft palate and then scoop scoop it above so you slide this uh, uh, St. Clair Thompson adenoid curate with cage you push it into the soft pad engage the adenoid and then scoop it above like this this is the movement you use to remove the adenoid tissue so this is actually with cage means it has two sharp teeth here it has two sharp teeth here so if you want to remove a tonsil adenoid tissue using adenoid tissue using St. Clair Thompson adenoid curate this cage ensures that the adenoid tissue is supported when you attempt to scoop it so it doesn't fall off so I'll be showing you a tons towards the end of this lecture a tonsillectomy video as well as adenoidectomy video where you will be seeing real time the use of these instruments now i personally don't like to use this uh, uh, st clair thompson adenoid curate with cage because this causes more trauma to the uh, posterior wall of the nasopharynx so what i do is i prefer a St. Clair Thompson adenoid curate without a cage so it is reasonably blunt so but I don't need to buy a new instrument because this cage can be removed so so you need not if you want to buy a St. Clair Thompson adenoid curate you ensure that you buy the one with a cage and the cage can be disentangled and removed so this is how you remove the cage from the first you open up the cage like this so now I am opening up the cage like this so now the mouth of the cage is opened and now there is a slot here so so I will put my nail in the slot slowly take it out so I have removed the cage so now this is the St. Clair Thompson RD not curate without a cage and the cage I have removed suppose I want to put the cage I just Say there is a small opening here small hole you see the hole should fit into the projection there and then you lock it and close the mouth so this is how you start to disassemble the Sinclair Thompson Adinar curate and I repeat again you hold it like a dagger so you hold the Adinar curate Sinclair Thompson Adinar curate like a dagger so you push the uh, cage along with the curate under the soft pellet ensure that your adenoid tissue is engaged and then you scoop it so you do this so by this upward scoop adenoid tissue will be removed
So the another instrument which uh, I have stopped using is a Yankers metal suction because all the suction tubes currently in market comes with a suction tube default. So this is actually a disposable suction tube. So I thought I will uh, show a, a picture of uh, that suction tube uh, during the course of today's class. So let me go to the atlas. Now this is the eave snare which I've been talking and this is the Negus knot adjuster. So you see the curve here. This is where you use this. This is where the it will be the thread should be anchored. This is the tip of the uh, tonsil holding valsalum. This is the tip of the tonsil holding valsalum. And then this is the tip of the vast tenaculum forceps. This is the tip of the vast tenaculum forceps where the tooth is a sharp tooth is shown. And this is the Yanker suction. You see it has a curvature, three curvature, so that it will ensure that it will slide into the oropharynx. And this is actually the plastic disposable uh, suction tip, Yanker suction tip, which is come currently available. And this is another modification of uh, tonsil holding forceps known as Dennis Brown forceps, where you don't have a sharp teeth. This causes the stroma. So now you see the tonsil being pulled medially and you see the eave snare, the snare wire, I think we should be able to see the snare wire is around the tonsil. You by by narrowing the snare wire or tightening the snare wire, you should be able to cut the tonsil, tonsil away from the tonsil bed. So advantage of snaring over the cutting of tonsil includes when you snare, you are you can you are choking the blood supply of the tonsil, and then uh, the trauma which you cause to the tissue when you use a snare releases tissue thromboplastin so thereby the bleeding is hypothetically said to be minimal. So personally, I don't uh, use a use tonsil snare because the snare wire always has a tendency to break at the most uh, opportune time. So that is a problem. Now I'm going to show you a video clipping of uh, tonsillectomy surgery which is going this to be a video real time shows uh, conventional cold so steel tonsillectomy being is where, performed this is actually the endotracheal cold tube is steel tonsillectomy uh, still remains the commonly performed surgical and procedure and now i'm using a yanker suction patient to is put suck under the sister rose tonsillectomy position this position cavity. limits the chances of aspiration during the surgical so you'll see procedure the tube. the mouth of the patient is uh, kept I'm open using the mouth and I've davis used a mouth gag tongue blade to open the mouth Mind you, I have used a microscope to record this video. So the images you see, the image you see will be slightly magnified and the bleeding you might see may look a little bit alarming, but it is not the case because whatever you see here are magnified five times. So this is uh, for recording purpose. I have used a, a microscope uh, to record this entire search. I am using a St. Clair Thompson adenoid Saint Claire Thompson grid without cages seen being cleared. introduced so behind the soft the palate to tissue, scoop out the adenoid above. tissue. You see the so it Bleeding falls off. So that is a problem with this the nasal uh, without cage uh, St. Clair Thompson adenoid uh, cure. So you see the adenoid tissue has fallen off. Now I am using a younger suction to retrieve the adenoid tissue from the nasal pharynx. Then I am using the adenoid cure again to do another repeat scoop so that the remnant adenoid can be scooped out effectively. So now I am sucking out the remnant adenoid tissue as well as the bleeder from the nasopharyngeal area. The next thing I need to do is to pack the nasopharynx. So I always prefer to do the adenoidectomy before I proceed to tonsillectomy because by the time I complete tonsillectomy, the adenoid bleeding would have stopped. So usually it takes around three to four minutes for the adenoid bleed to stop. Supposing if I'm going to uh, do the adenoidectomy towards the end of the surgery. So I may not uh, know whether the adenoid bleed has stopped or not. So ideally, I prefer to do the adenoidectomy before I start the tonsillectomy procedure. So now I have completed the adenoidectomy. I have packed the nasopharynx area with a roller gas tissue. So I am using uh, two roller gases just to ensure that the area of bleeding are tamponaded effectively. 
now after packing with the roller gas i apply suction to clear the field The next instrument you will be seeing is a valsal lamp, which you are going to use to hold the tonsil. Now I am using the valsal lamp, I am holding it in my left hand. Tosilla tissue is I'm held with valsalum. Medialize the Right tonsil tissue. So I'm putting the tonsil medially. To the tissue medial to so anterior pillar. The stretching movement. The incision is then rounded up to the uvula. Help me Cotton to visualize the anterior pillar location effectively. So I'm citing the incision just as close to the tonsil tissue, thereby separating it from the capsule. The tonsil and after being dissected up to the level of its inferior pole is seen being clamped and cut. the superior pole. Now I am putting in trying to insert a cotton ball into the superior pillar, superior uh, pole, and slowly the tonsil is slowly being stripped away from the tonsillar bed. I keep inserting cotton ball. So this insertion per se will aid dramatically with minimal trauma separate the tonsil from the tonsillar back or from its capsule so i keep uh, packing the fossa with the cotton ball so you see the tonsil getting separated the moment i keep packing the tonsil gets separated beautifully from its capsule so now so you see the tonsil out of the slowly coming out of the tonsillar fossa I think you should be able to see it clearly. So now, so I am dissecting the tonsil. So I ensure that I get as close to the inferior pole of the tonsil as possible. So the bleeding you see is because of the magnifying effect of the microscope. So normally we don't use microscope uh, to perform tonsillectomy. I used uh, microscope just to get this recording done so that this bit. So I'm using a curved bricket artery forceps. I'm clamping the lower pole. Then I'm using a medicine bomb scissors to cut the tonsillate tissue. See, slowly I'm cutting it. Let's come on. So now I need to ligate that lower pole lower pole area from which the pedicle from which i have cut the tonsil so i'll be using silk to ligate that area silk usually falls up so i'm using the straight artery forceps to pass the silk around the forceps and the ligature can be done so now i think uh, the tissue has uh, slipped from the forceps so i'm packing that area using my index finger to pack it more tightly you need not even ligate it you can wait for some time the bleeding will invariably stop so i thought i will pack the repack the fossa once again with the cotton ball to ensure that uh, effectively it stops the bleeding so i put in cotton ball there
now we have left with uh, the other tonsil other side tonsil which is going to be removed in the same way which we have removed the right one So I am holding the left tonsil, the valsalum is in my right hand, so pulling it immediately, I will be using the vast inoculum forceps to put the incision as close to the anterior pillar as possible. By pulling it immediately, we will be stretching the anterior pillar so that we will be knowing clearly where the incision should be sited and now the superior pole is slowly visible the tonsil has been separated from its superior pole and that pole can be that area superior uh, yeah, portion of the tonsillar bed tonsillar fossa can be packed with the cotton ball as you remove as you separate the tonsil from the tonsillar bed or the capsule you keep uh, packing the tonsillar fossa with cotton ball so that uh, bleeding will be minimal now just it is literally we are close to the lower pole now is the time for the curved bricket forceps to be applied to the lower pole clearly delineating the lower pole now pulling it medially, we will be knowing exactly where to clamp. So I am using the briquette scout artery for subs to clamp the lower pole. And then I will be using a curved medicine bomb scissor. The medicine bomb scissor as I have been telling you should be, the curvature should be pointed towards the uvula while I cut the tonsil from its lower pole. So now, I cut the tonsil. So now, you can ligate the lower pole using silk. And let me assure you, the silk falls off on the third or fourth day. Sometimes, say some of the silk material can take a week to fall. But ultimately, this, as see, it is going around the tip of the curved artery forceps. The silk should be threaded around the tip of the curved artery forceps. So now it's threaded, pulled out, and then we are ligating it. See how I tighten the knot uh, using my finger. So I use my index finger to tighten the knot. So I tighten the knot, so I put three knots, tighten it, ensure the knot is tight by pushing it with my index finger, then the third knot I think I am applying. If you have a long finger, finger is the best. If you feel that your fingers are slightly shorter, don't hesitate to use the negus knot adjuster. Instead of a finger, the negus knot adjuster can be used to tighten the knot. So I am going to cut the silk, remember, excess silk there. Now I will remove the clamp. So absolutely there won't be any bleeding after I ligate the uh, lower pedicle. I apply suction. Slowly I will start to remove the packing which I have done and verify and look for evidence of bleeding. The first uh, nasal pack, adenoid pack has come out. The second adenoid pack is coming out now and I'll be using the pillar retractor, Mollison's pillar retractor to retract the pillar to see or look for bleeding within the tonsillar fossa. So now we will be seeing the Mollison's pillar retractor in action. So I'll be using the straight briquettes forceps to remove the cotton ball. I repeat again, I'll be using the straight briquettes forceps to remove the cotton ball from the tonsillar fossa. Then I'll be using the pillar retractor, Mollison's pillar retractor to retract the anterior pillar and to look for 
any evidence of bleeding from within the tonsillar vein. So now I am using the straight bricket straight artery forceps, removing it. Now gently I will be using the pillar retractor. See the pillar retractor is being used to retract the pillar. So now the pillar retractor is ideally held on the dominant hand for the right side. So now you are seeing the force are better when you retract the anterior pillar. So now I am wiping the force with the cotton ball. And now you see the force. So I am using the pillar retractor, Mollison pillar retractor to retract the anterior pillar. So now when I am going to retract the pillar retractor, on the left tonsillar posa, I need I need to hold the pillar retractor on my left hand. So now I am holding the pillar retractor on the left hand, allowing my dominant hand to be free. So now you see the Mollison pillar retractor is used to held in my left hand, and it is gently pulled. The anterior pillar is gently pulled upwards and laterally, so that you will be visualizing the posa very clearly. So now you are seeing the use of Mollison's pillar retractor. Now there is a little bit of bleeding. Let us see where the bleeding is coming from. So, yes, we have located the bleeder. You can also clearly see where it is coming from. And now is the time to handle that bleed. So this step will show you how the bleeder is going to be handled. You can you are you can either catch the bleeder using the straight brickets forceps or you can use a bipolar cartridge to remove it. So now I'm I packed it just to make sure that uh, if the bleeding I'm look, I'm seeking for an easier solution by packing some of the bleeding in some of the cases can stop on its own. So I thought, okay, let me pack for some time and see. So I have packed the posa with cotton ball. So there is something called the normal clotting time for patients. So I think we need to wait for some time. Let us see if the bleeding stops on its own before we try to physically stop the bleeding using either electrocautery or by using a silk ligature. Now I this is the bipolar cartridge which I am going to use. Sorry, my finger is coming in the way because I am using a microscope. So my finger is slowly entering it. So let me see. Shake here. I am using a bipolar cartridge to cauterize the bleeder. So now the bleeding has been cauterized. Now, right. now more or less. Uh, Reader has been cauterized. Now you see, have seen the electro cautery in action. In this video, it's a bipolar cautery. It is safe to use. You can use it as if you use any other forceps. Now I am checking the forza for any bleed. I am using the Mollison pillar retractor to visualize the tonsil forza clearly. Actually, there is no bleeding. We are coming to the end of the surgical procedure. I am just verifying the other fossa. There is absolutely no bleed there. So the surgery is over. And thank you very much for your patient listening.